We decided to put together a living artist who is with us today, who works with posthumous casts. And um, that's Liz Glynn. And uh, we also have a speaker, and I will give their biographies in a minute, the, um, an expert on uh, Renaissance cast, the, act, the afterlife of Michelangelo's Vatican Pieta, which is Lisa Raffanelli. And uh, the third person on our uh, panel is going to speak about the doctrine of moral rights, which we thought was very important in terms of many of the issues that we are speaking about. So I will present them, each one of them, um, as they speak. Our first speaker is Liz Glynn, and Liz is speaking to us today from London. She is an, uh, a creator of sculpture, large-scale installations, and participatory performances using epic historical narratives to explore the potential for change in the present tense. Um, her work seeks to explore the individual agency with complex superstructures in the face of an increasingly abstract economy. And uh, she has had um, exhibitions at Open House, a project of the Public Art Fund in New York, a show called The Myth of Singularity, which she's gonna talk about today at LACMA uh, in Los Angeles, Ransom Room, which is a solo exhibition Ooh. and durational performance at the Sculpture Center in New York, and Delusions of Grandeur, Monumentality and Other Myths, which was a five-part series of performances exploring monumentality and human ambition at LACMA. Her work has been presented at the New Museum, the Barbican in London, MOCA, the Hammer, uh, the Cordova Sculpture Park, the Petit Palais in Paris, uh, in, and in, also in uh, Austria at Graz. Uh, she's been featured in the New York Times, New York Magazine, Art Forum, Vanity Fair, the LA Times, the New Yorker, um, W Interview, Domus, Archaeology Magazine, and Freeze. So without further ado, I present to you Liz Glynn via Skype. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for having me. So in 2013, um, I began a cycle of performances at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, responding to monumental works in the museum's collection. I had turned to the work of August Rodin as an afterthought, doing due diligence in my research. I had no interest in figurative sculpture, and I was wary of large-scale bronze. This is an image of Jean Dauphine draped, uh, one of the figures from the Bur Burgers of Calais, first modeled by Rodin, 1885 to 1886. This cast was made just over 100 years later in 1987. Um, in the course of my research, I discovered that part of the problem for me was that I was unable to see the quote unquote real Rodin, whose services were not properly replicated in the posthumous casts. Next slide, please. Today I'm going to talk about one of five performances in, from a series entitled Delusions of Grandeur, Monumentality and Other Myths. The initial impetus has been to look at the process of conceiving, fabricating, moving and maintaining large-scale works of minimalist sculpture. Okay. This is an image from a two-day long performance entitled The Myth of Singularity after August Rodin, where I worked with eight young sculpture assistants to explore Rodin's casting process of cannibalization, fragmentation, and recycling using a series of fragmentary molds created from the posthumous bronzes in Lachman's collection. Um, this was an attempt to reinscribe a notion of process and performativity into sculptures which today are viewed as static and timeless. Next slide. Uh, relics from the performance were later cast in bronze, a process which greatly illuminated some of the issues surrounding posthumous casting, and I'll talk about these processes later. But first, a few words about Rodin. Next slide. This is an image of Rodin's funeral in 1917, when he died a national hero. Next slide. But a funny thing happened to me when I began researching Rodin's practice. I fell in love, um, a notion completely at odds with any boundaries of conceptual rigor. Um, the Rodin I fell in love with was not the founding father of modern sculpture, the monolithic man whose greatest hits included the thinker and the kiss. Um, the Rodin who held my interest was the sculptor who created fragmentation and failure, this, um, these bits littering the studio floor. Next slide. Um, I became obsessed with this artist working with bits and pieces um, of the unfinished gates of hell all over the studio. Verdun, who kept his ridiculed monument to Balzac fondly in his garden after it was rejected from the Paris Salon. Um, Eric Gibson wrote of Verdun cannibalizing his own oeuvre, and this process struck me as not merely modern, but in fact contemporary. 
Um, this is an image of drawers of hands in Redon's studio, an archive of gestures, attempts at gesture, and variations on a theme. Next slide. This is another small plaster study work drawn from cast-offs um, while he was making the burgers of Calais. Many of the marks of Redon's hands, which remain today, exist in these smaller plaster and clay works. Notions of assemblage and the ruin, which only later became important threads in modern sculpture, are already present in this early work. Next slide. This is Sleep from 1989, a study work composed of plaster, paper, clay, and newspaper. The small pencil marks on the face evidence the point-to-point -point enlarging machine having been applied to the model. It's one of my favorite works of Rodin, um, and you really get the sense of this sort of fleshy, um, process-based um, investigation. Next slide. This is Rodin's 3D pantograph, the predecessor to the three, to 3D laser profilometry. At the height of his production, Rodin was working with up to 50 assistants, but there was one specifically dedicated to the process of enlargement, and Rodin would personally oversee the details. Next slide. Um, in Meditation Without Arms, 1883-1884, you can see the visible parting lines, residue from the process of making a cast from multi-part multi mold. In many of Rodin's works, he left evidence of the process of mold making and casting intact, not only in the plasters, but also in the bronzes. He's announcing that this is not merely a body made of bronze or plaster, it's a sculpture of a body, and there's actually a um, substantive difference. Next slide. Um, over the next few slides, I just want to show a few images tracing Rodin's seven-year quest to construct a monument to Honoré de Balzac, venerated French novelist. In 1891, when Rodin was awarded the commission, Balzac had been dead for over 40 years. These are two studies from 1892. Next slide. Um, Rodin went so far as to travel to the town where Balzac had lived and sought out his tailor to reconstruct a copy of the frock coat, which Balzac was known to have worn around the house while he was writing. Next slide. Here's a lovely 1897 terracotta model of the disembodied frock coat. You can really see the hand in this work, um, and it feels radically different than those um, the posthumous bronze I showed at the beginning of the talk. Next slide. Um, a number of variations on Balzac's head were constructed. Next slide. Uh, next image. And ultimately, Rodin settled on perhaps the least realistic, this one. Next slide. When the final abstract sculpture debuted at the Paris Salon in 1898, following the year when the Kiss received a grand reception, um, this work was lampooned as cartoonish. Um, it suggested that Balzac is clutching his crotch under his dressing gown, and the vulgarity of his posture, coupled with Rodin's radical deviation from pictorialism, was just too much for the Salon at this time. Other artists supported the work, um, but his commission was canceled, and Rodin never saw this work cast in bronze. Next slide. Um, Rodin stood by the work. He installed it in his garden in Modon, um, and this is a photograph by Edward Steichen. Um, it wasn't cast until 1935 in bronze, when the Musée Rodin commissioned a cast by Alexandre Rudier's studio, um, which is now held in the Musée Rodin in Paris. Um, the story is probably uh, much known amongst this audience, where uh, upon Rodin's death, he willed his estate to the French people, and the Musée Rodin was established. Uh, next slide. Um, going forward, um, but there's been uh, one more slide forward. Next slide. Yes, great. Um, this is uh, the monument to Balzac um, as it appears in uh, the collection of the Los Angeles Contemporary Art, uh, cast circa 1965. When I began working on the project for LACMA, my first thought was to take molds of the Rodin sculptures. Um, this is sort of an act of sacrilege. You're not even really supposed to touch the sculptures. And I kept thinking about whether there was a way around it. I thought about it for several months before I even said anything out loud to the curator. Um, but casting was integral to understanding Rodin's work and to engage in this process, physical contact with the sculptures was necessary. Next slide. Um, during my research, I stumbled across the controversy surrounding the posthumous casts. Theorists um, had argued that the posthumously cast Rodins should not be considered real because the surface quality of the bronze was not properly replicated. Um, a lifetime cast Rodin, such as this thinker, bombed by the weather underground at the Cleveland Museum, is considered both rare and maybe even priceless. Next slide. The point that, um, 
after the thinker was bombed, uh, they allowed this one to stay intact with its blown apart base in spite of the great damage because of the value of the surface. Next slide. Um, returning to LACMA, I was working with the curator Jose Luis Blondet, who is the curator of education and special projects, um, an envelope including the performance art programming. I shared my idea with Jose Luis, and he first approached the Department of Objects Conservation to discuss the proposal. He started with the question of whether it was physically possible to do this process without harming the objects. The answer, surprisingly, was yes. We use silicone molds all the time for conservation purposes. Um, as we were meeting outside, the uh, conservator gestured towards Chris Burden's urban light, where they're often taking molds to replace the um, plates at the bottom of the light posts. Next slide. However, so the question of whether the museum would allow me to take the molds of posthumous astronauts, um, the initial reply was absolutely not. Uh, they were afraid that I would make souvenirs. Um, even when I offered to uh, cut up the molds or donate the molds at the end of the performance, the answer was still no. The conservator suggested I contact the Getty about using 3D laser profilometry. But for me, this was completely outside the scope of Radon's practice. Um, there was one caveat. If the museum's director, Michael Govan, gave his consent, they would have to find a way. Next slide. Um, in any case, after three more months of back and forth between Jose Luis, Michael Govan, um, the curator of European art and the Department of Conservation, I found myself under the supervision of the Department of Objects Conservation making my first test mold. Um, the bronzes of Lacmas collection, most of which were cast circa 1965 or later, are protected by a heavy coat of Incralac, um, a lacquer to protect the bronze and uh, they're treated with paste wax every six months. We also added additional layers of barrier wax to protect uh, the sculpture. Um, I'm using a platinum cure silicone here. Next slide. Um, because I discovered um, during the course of making the molds that the conservators routinely apply a green pigmented paste wax with no direction whatsoever from the curators to make these Rodans look more authentic in their words. I discovered this from cleaning the bird dew off the monument to Balzac prior to taking a mold and the cloth I was using came back completely green. The conservator said don't worry they would replace it. Next slide. Um, here are all the fragmentary molds in progress. Next slide. Um, I had the pleasure of working with a 40-year veteran conservator, Don Medveg, who was incredibly generous with his time. Um, we traded shop doc talking about the enamel he was using on an Oldenburg plaster restoration and going back and forth about what tools were used in a studio today versus what the conservation lab might use to repair a modern or contemporary work. Next slide. Um, one day, Michael Govan walked by with a patron while I was on a lift, um, applying the neon rubber to the monument to Balzac's face. I shouted down, don't worry, I'll be done soon. And he said, take your time, it looks better that way. I think part of the museum's director's motivation in allowing this intervention to happen was to reactivate an area in the collection that had been dead to many, myself included. Next slide. And I added plaster bandage mold, mother molds to the silicone, which were later reinforced in the studio. Next slide. Um, the performance began quietly. Um, we're, we set up to recreate Rodin's studio process in a live two-day performance open to the general public. Next slide. Um, starting with eight steel armatures and a set of fragmentary molds, a group of assistants and I went about the work of building up a series of collaged Frankenstein bodies. Next slide. Um, here's Daniel Small applying release to a mold. Next slide. And um, we recreated Rodin's 3D pantograph, the point-to-point -point enlarging machine. Here it is working on a foot. Next slide. In homage to the monument to Balzac, I have Rebecca Clendenning create this burlap frock coat, which we coated in plaster. Next slide. I invited a number of LACMA staff members to read texts about Rodin's process. One of my favorite lines came from Rodin himself. Uh, what about cathedrals? Are they ever finished? Next slide. Um, I actively performed the act of cannibalization, tearing pieces off different sculptures and repurposing the fragments in places where they were never intended to go. Next slide. In Rodin's work, flesh is flesh and the texture of a thigh is not necessarily different than that of a face. 
I sought to try to use the fragments in ways outside of their um, prescribed functionality, as you can see from the face um, at, uh, on the posterior of this work. Next slide. I wanted the sculptures to bear the marks of our hands, thumbs moving through wet plaster, burlap texture exposed. All of this nods back to Rodin's own insistence on leaving the parting lines present and not fully grinding down the sprues from the casting process. They're sculptures made by human hands, not intended just to become bodies in bronze. Next slide. Um, initially, the performance was meant to be an end unto itself, but when I saw the completed work, Standing in the Garden with Jose Luis Bondet, I said to him, wouldn't it be amazing to turn them back into bronze and complete the cycle? Next slide. Um, however, I had a lot of reservations. Bronze, for me, was the place where contemporary sculpture went to die, and sculptors went to live comfortably, producing editions of a finite, identifiable aesthetic um, without any interrogation of what the material meant. Um, I wanted the improvisatory, active nature of the performance to remain intact in these works, like the rubble that I'd shoved into the face of Thinker, this work. Next slide or this arm from Berger with extended arm, which dropped an extra six inches when its armature was not properly secured. The hollowness of, of um, the fist and the hand, um, the feet even standing on these uh, buckets where the plaster had settled. Next slide. Um, in order to create the bronzes, I began creating a 178 page PDF documenting every detail of the um, plasters that I wanted preserved. Next slide. The foundry made a set of silicone molds after we discussed the placement of the parting lines and the numerous challenges in the level of detail I wanted. Next slide. When I entered the foundry, warehouse covered with layers of plaster dust and metal chips, poor lighting, mingling smells of wax and propane, I felt completely blind. I didn't know how to see the sculptures in the dead looking wax positive in front of me, and I was honestly afraid that I'd made a big mistake. I'd initially been called in to approve for the waxes for casting, but I ended up staying through that day and then for another six months to complete the process of creating eight works in bronze. Next slide. Um, I had to learn to use a whole new set of tools. I looked at the reference images of the plaster from which the work had been molded and cast and began cutting into the waxes, removing chunks of wax where clay was necessary to fill the deep undercuts. Next slide. Slowly the lightness of the bodies reemerged. Next slide. Areas like these dangling threads can't be registered in the mold. They need to be recreated by hand every time the work is cast. Next slide. Texture is recreated with burlap dipped in wax and every last thread is added back in. Next slide. That's the red you can see. Um, here's the fist of the burger with extended arm. The red wax fills in micro bubbles on the surface and this piece alone takes about three hours of my labor to correct. One might argue that the foundry could complete this labor or an assistant, but in my experience, no one is gonna care as much as I do. And that care makes the complete difference in the finished work. Next slide. Um, following the completions of the waxes, they're dipped daily in layers of ceramic shell over three weeks. Next slide. They're reinforced with cement and chicken wire. Next slide. And then uh, molten metal is poured into the shell and subsequently pieces are welded back together, and then one of the foundry workers uses a Dremel to recreate all the texture on the parting line. Um, next slide. I come in to review the pieces, help polish them, usually ask for a few additional Dremel marks to make sure that there's no evidence of where the piece was joined. Next slide. In homage to Rodin, these are some of the only works of my sculpture that I've signed. Um, each is signed uniquely in the wax by my own hand. They're not numbered. Next slide. Um, this is a detail of the raw polished bronze prior to patina. Next slide. I wanted to recreate the patina pioneered by Rodin with Jean LeMay during his lifetime. It's a three layer patina beginning with a liver of sulfur shown here, then layers of cupric nitrate with bits of ferric applied with a brush. Rodin used ammonia as well, but I chose not to because of the toxicity. Um, this is a hot torch patina and the color is only correct within a 10 degree range. Um, you can tell it's the correct range by the sizzling sound the brush makes when it hits the metal. The head of the foundry I work with has been doing this patina for over 30 years. It's the one thing in the foundry that he won't delegate, and I've learned to do it side by side with him, though I can't do it on my own at this point. 
Um, it should be noted that this liver of sulfur patina is where most of the posthumous casts stop. They don't do the other two layers, um, which give you the nuanced kind of watery surface. Um, so this is just after the first coat of the liver of sulfur. Next slide. Um, and then this is the finished cast of um, Untitled After the Thinker on Hewitt Lacma. Next slide. Um, this was the detail that I was able to preserve, um, and this gives you a good view of the patina, which is somewhat difficult to photograph. Um, I really wanted to create the, the sense of the at-handedness, this um, gesture, and all these tiny details, um, which are very difficult to recreate. Next slide. Um, we installed the work in juxtaposition to some of Rodin's study works, a testament to his process. Um, this is a study of the monument to Balzac. Next slide. Um, details like the rebar armature remain intact and were recreated. Next slide. Um, I'd been interested in how the burlap in the work gives the work a bandage quality, and the works kind of look almost fragmentary, like they had been bombed. Next slide. So detail of the face, and the, you can see the abs from the prodigal sun on the thigh of the work. Next slide. Um, let's go forward one more. Okay. The greatest compliment the curator paid to me when he saw them was to say that they look unfinished. Um, rather than edit out the evidence of the performance, I chose to keep it intact. The argument I'd like to make today is that caring matters, and there's actually a difference between literally phoning it in, though I think it's terribly interesting in the case of Tony Smith, and taking the time to figure it out. Um, in Tony Smith's case, he was able to phone it in because he had the experience of working through the material. Contemporary art today rewards the new, the next, the on-demand delivered immediately. I would argue for a different form of immediacy, the feeling of the object in the hand, the infinite space-time that opens if only one allows it. Um, there's a lot that I know um, and I know what I want, but it's ineffable. I can't explain it. I can only do it and enact it. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Liz, for that wonderful, wonderful experiential talk. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of things to say about it. Uh, our next speaker is Lisa Raffanelli. She is a professor of Italian Renaissance art history at Manhattan Mill College in Purchase, New York. Her research includes the relationship of early modern feminist theory to the visual arts, the thematization of the senses in 16th century European art, and the reception of the European Renaissance in modern American culture. She has co-authored a monograph called Faith, Gender, and the Senses in Italian Renaissance and Baroque Art, Interpreting the Noli, Noli Metangere and Doubting Thomas, published by Ashgate in 2015. And the topic of uh, Lisa's talk today is the afterlife of Michelangelo's Vatican Pieta. Thank you. How do I press the wrong button? So thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. This is, um, I've learned so much already, and I almost wish I could go home and rewrite my paper now that I have some terminology that I didn't have this morning. Um, the talk that I'm presenting to you today is part of a, a work in progress, uh, chronicling the object history of Michelangelo's Vatican Pietà. Uh, this is a story that spans centuries and is both dependent upon and independent of the sculpture's original function and the critical fortunes of its creator. Over its long life, the Pietà has defied easy categorization. Funerary monument, devotional icon, aesthetic miracle, work of genius. So too, over its long life, different groups have laid claim to the sculpture, latching on to one aspect or another of its identity, while viewing it through lenses colored by their own horizons of expectation. To suit the needs of these various groups, the Pieta has been relocated, restaged, and recontextualized numerous times. Although with the exception of the 1964 World's Fair in New York City, it remains within St. Peter's Basilica. The accumulated histories and renegotiated meanings of the Pieta, what I'm referring to as its afterlife, and I know I'm using it somewhat differently than everyone else, um, hinge not only upon the changing contexts of its display and use over time, but also upon a group of images 
that might best be described as artistic progeny. Uh, large scale, unique sculpted variants, smaller scale reproductive prints, and plast plaster and bronze casts produced both during the artist's lifetime and after. Now admittedly, this is a diverse array of objects that serve different purposes and different audiences. But I've found that they share certain key characteristics. All exhibit the same iconographic subject and despite incidental or purposeful variation, have a fidelity to the likeness of the original that is unambiguous and intentional. They are not intended to deceive or misrepresent authorship, but rather to disseminate the likeness of the original. As icon is to sacred archetype, these images derive their aesthetic, devotional, and commercial value from the authority of the original. That said, each image also generates its own meanings based on patronage, audience, and context. Meanings that ultimately reflect back onto the original, creating a semantic feedback loop in which the significance of archetype and reproduction are codependent and evolve over time. So just a bit of background. Um, in August 1499, French Cardinal Jean Lacroix commissioned Michelangelo to sculpt a marble monument depicting the Virgin Mary with the dead Christ, a popular devotional subject in German and French medieval art, and one that appeared frequently in funerary settings. In 1500, the sculpture was installed above an altar in the rotunda of Santa Petronilla, um, an ancient structure attached to the southern transept of St. Peter's, which was also known as the Chapel of the Kings of France. A nearby tomb slab marked the cardinal's final resting place. Within short order, the Pietà began a series of moves around the basilica. The first was necessitated by the demolition and reconstruction sorry, uh, of the choir under Pope Julius II. So the work in 1505 begins back here under Julius II. And in a very short amount of time, the structural integrity of Santa Petronilla was threatened. And the Pietà was moved here to a chapel called the Secretarium in about 1514, 1517. This is an ancient rectangular chapel at the southeast corner of the nave of the basilica. It would stay in this place until 1568. This site was chosen because it was a privileged space far from the construction zone. It served as the burial site for some of the earliest popes and served continually as the vestry for the basilica. Because it was in continual use by clergy, access was limited. Contemporaries complained about this and about the sculpture's poor visibility and lighting conditions. Despite its obscure location, the Pietà became famous as both a venerated image and artistic masterpiece by the first half of the century, just as its association with the original patron faded. Its fame is attested to, but also I think in part due to its artistic progeny. Sculptural variants, prints, and casts, often created with the, no the artist's knowledge and permission, reinforced the canonicity of the Pietà and secured Michelangelo's reputation as a divinely inspired genius. The earliest reproductions of the Pietà are full-scale marble sculptures from the 1530s to 40s. The first is carved by Pietro Lorenzetto, for the German National Church of Santa Maria dell'Anima in Rome, and the second by Nani di Baccio Bigio for Santo Spirito in Florence. Uh, to keep this within time, I'm just going to focus on uh, the Bigio. Bigio's sculpture, a devotional work in its own right, arguably satisfied a number of secular concerns as well as devotional. For example, Bigio's patron, Luigi del Riccio, was a Florentine merchant and a close friend of Michelangelo. And it is thought that Riccio commissioned this work, an imitazione of the Vatican Pietà, as a testament to his friendship with the artist. Biggio, like so many sculptors of his age, 
lived in Michelangelo's shadow. For him, success would be measured by a bravura performance of the master's style. The pride he took in his work is attested to by his signature on the Virgin's sash. Uh, he says, in imitation. Um, replacing Michelangelo's name with his own while simultaneously acknowledging his debt. It's likely that Biggio's fidelity to the original also served Michelangelo's needs. By the late 1540s, Michelangelo was actively engaged in securing his legacy for future generations. Biographies were in the offing, and he was in discussions with Luigi Del Riccio about collecting and publishing his poetry. He was also, for the first time, fending off critics, among them Pietro Aretino, who in 1545 famously condemned the nude figures in The Last Judgment. But as early as 1537, had criticized Michelangelo's artistic judgment in depicting Mary in the Vatican Pietà as a youthful maiden. With this context, Biggio's faithful imitazione can be seen as a reaffirmation of the piety and decorum of the original, no corrections needed. Biggio's sculpture also served as a proxy for the original, in a sense liberating it from its obscure location in St. Peter's and bringing it to Florence, Michelangelo's hometown. Finally, Biggio's signature, which some describe as a boastful bid to outdo the master, actually does the opposite. It proves that Michelangelo need not be named in order to be recognized as the creator. Contemporaries appear to have recognized Michelangelo's artistic agency in Biggio's copy, which I hope makes a little more clear this idea that I brought up of the reciprocity of meaning between original and reproduction. An anonymous 1549 critic wrote about the Biggio sculpture. They say that it derives from that inventor of obscenities, Michelangelo Buonarroti, who's concerned only with art and not with piety. These words, like Aretino's criticisms about the Virgin's youth, are shaped by the counter-reformatory belief that artists should adhere to tradition and scripture and avoid artistic license. In his 1550 biography of Michelangelo, Giorgio Vasari attempts to address these criticisms by quoting a madrigal written by Giovanni Battista Strozzi. And I'm just putting it up here for your enjoyment. Scholars have actually established that the madrigal was written for Biggio's Pietà, but its inclusion in Michelangelo's biography helps to shape understanding of the Vatican Pietà for centuries to come. The madrigal offers a pious rationale for the youth of the Virgin. She is at once spouse, daughter, and mother, and refers to the artist's ability to animate stone. Oops, I'm really not good with this. Sorry, guys. Which is a trope of praise. Uh, that becomes quite common mid-century and bolsters claims that Michelangelo's skills are not just God-given, but divine. The earliest mass-produced engravings of the Pieta date to 1547 at exactly this moment. And they are part of a shift in the print culture at this time that favored reproductive engravings of famous works of art more than original compositions. The intended audience was diverse, religious devotees, pilgrims, collectors, students. But in each case, the print was valuable only insofar as it captured the likeness and spirit of the original. Thus, engravers did not significantly alter or reinterpret Michelangelo's conception, but replicated the composition, positioning, and gestures of the figures, the youthful beauty of the Virgin, and the restrained emotional tenor of her mourning. If they altered anything, it was the setting. Right, so we go from a kind of pastoral setting to a niche that's uh, decrepit, that makes it look like an antiquity, to the mouth of a tomb. Um, these varied settings 
combined with the fact that none of the prints mention the original patron, Cardinal La Grola, helped to conceptually unmoor the Pietà from its liturgical function and ecclesiastical context. The prints, whether viewed through a secular or devotional lens, demonstrate that by mid-century, sculpture and sculptor were indivisible. In February of 1546, King Francois Ier wrote to Michelangelo seeking permission for his artistic agent, Francesco Primaticcio, to make cast molds of the Vatican Pietà and the risen Christ of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. The artist agreed. The king had long sought an original sculpture by the master, but would now settle for a substitute in the form of a cast. Primaticcio was already in Rome making molds of famous antique sculptures in the Vatican, which were to be used to cast bronze sculptures for the Chateau of Fontainebleau. The Pietà would not be cast in bronze, but in plaster, because it was in intended for an interior location, the main chapel, where it remained for over a century. In the Renaissance, plaster was seen as a humble medium, and casts were typically used as teaching aids in artists' studios. At Fontainebleau, however, the plaster cast was valued aesthetically. Since molds were formed via direct physical contact with the archetype, they possessed a tactile memory of the hand of the original artist. To borrow a term, they ensouled the spirit of the original work. The cast is thus an experiential mediator. We may see a cast, but we experience Michelangelo's Pietà. Over the next century, plaster casts of ancient and Renaissance masterpieces, mostly those that Francois Premier had selected, made their way into noble collections and cast courts throughout Europe. Although quality varied greatly because molds were frequently reused and new molds were made from previous casts, resulting in a degradation of detail. During this time, the Pietà, the original that is, was on the move. In 1568, four years after Michelangelo's death, it was relocated from the Secretarium to the Canon's Choir. This choir served as a mausoleum for Pope Sixtus IV and the permanent home of the Chapter of St. Peter's, or the College of Canons. The body of priests and clerics charged with the physical and ritual maintenance of the basilica, including the daily prayers known as the divine office. Time prevents a full discussion of the motivations for this move, but it is important to note that for the next two centuries, the Pietà came to be so closely associated with the ritual life of the basilica and with the canons that each time they were relocated during the reconstruction, the Pietà traveled with them until they finally both settled into the new choir here in 1625. Even though contemporaries complained that the sculpture was difficult to see in its new home, its renown, particularly as a devotional image, grew. In 1637, it became the second venerated Marian image in the basilica to be crowned an honor normally reserved for miracle-working icons. During the ensuing century and a quarter, much changed. The church began to lose its grip on temporal power as princes and rulers envisioned statehood free from church control. Rome, long a mecca for religious pilgrims, now became a destination for a new breed of traveler, the grand tourist, many hailing from Protestant nations deeply suspicious of Catholicism. For these secular pilgrims, a visit to Rome provided an unparalleled cultural, historic, and aesthetic education. Tourists were drawn to the ruins of empire and the magnificent sculptures of the Vatican, seeking out the works they knew only from plaster casts. Works of great Renaissance masters were also a lure, thanks in part to translations of Vasari. Travel logs and diaries of grand tourists dutifully record re reactions to works like Raphael's Transfiguration, 
Michelangelo's Moses, or his last judgment, although far fewer make mention of the Pietà. Perhaps this was due to its obscure location, or perhaps its prominent role in church ritual together with the subject matter were barriers to Protestants who were jittery about idolatry and mariolatry. On occasion, though, you can find a travelogue that mentions the unfortunate um, mistake that he made in pre presenting the Virgin as a youthful maiden. The final move of the Pietà came just before the Jubilee of 1750, when it was installed in the Chapel of the Crucifix, the first chapel to the, to the right of the entrance of the Basilica, where it remains. Here the Pietà was liberated from its confinement in the choir and its centrality to the daily devotions and rituals of the canons, and it became a more accessible, visible symbol of the church. And here it remained through the 19th and 20th centuries, a time when the popular appeal of the statue reached new heights. And I'm just giving you a small sample. There are just so many. I, can't, I don't even have any idea how many there are. Uh, countless copies, some cast, some carved in workshops near Carrara, came to populate cemeteries and religious shrines across the globe. So here is just a workshop in Pietra Santa. Here is a, a, a cemetery in Vermont, uh, the Trocadero in Paris, another workshop where we can see multiples, and here uh, the Hyderabad province of India. Um, at this moment, art historical and philo philosophical discourse increasingly privileged originality and authenticity. Walter Benjamin's 1935 admonitions about the dangers of mechanical reproduction diminishing the aura of the original work of art are a case in point. And what else other than concern about an artist's original intentions, no matter how impossible they were to recreate at this point, could explain the 1927 Vatican decision prompted by art historian Charles de Tolnay to remove the crown bestowed in 1637. And of course, this is the moment when plaster casts in museums worldwide were beginning to be dismantled, the casts relegated to storage. When the extraordinary decision was made by Pope John XXIII, to allow the Pietà to be installed as the centerpiece of the Vatican Pavilion at the 1964-1965 World's Fair in New York City. It was born of this belief that only the original would do. Dismissing the concerns of conservators, curators, artists, and art experts, the Pope believed that the Pietà had an important role to play as an ambassador for the church in post-Vatican II a climate calling for greater engagement with the modern world. Michelangelo's masterwork traveled across the Atlantic in an ocean liner named the Cristofero Colombo <laughs> in a crate that was specially made that had flotation devices and lights and special packing pearls. Um, and in this process, interestingly enough, new uses were found for plaster casts. Uh, one was placed atop the altar in St. Peter's as a temporary sur surrogate for the original, presumably not to disappoint tourists. Another, owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, was used as a stand-in during the construction of the Vatican Pavilion in New York until the original arrived. Yet another was used by a group of artists who objected to the loan they strapped it onto the roof of a car and drove around the streets of Florence, proclaiming that they had kidnapped the Pietà. <laughs> Millions of people viewed the Pietà in New York, waiting online to be whisked past the statue on conveyor belts, capable of moving 8,000 people per hour. It was a three-tiered <laughs> conveyor belt. Um, the Pietà's starring role at the fair ensured its status as a cultural icon and symbol of Catholic faith. Unfortunately, fame brought new risks. After its return to Rome and on the 21st of May, 1972, a man named Laszlo Toth entered St. Peter's and attacked the Pietà with a hammer, 
screaming, I am Jesus Christ. Newspaper headlines worldwide expressed horror and dismay about the damage and followed breathlessly as the sculpture's meticulous restoration took place on a world stage. And once again, plaster casts proved their worth, this time as physical repositories of what had been lost, helping conservators to recreate the gesture of broken fingers or the lost contours of the Virgin's shattered face. Never again would the Pietà be as physically or visually accessible to the devoted masses. It was reinstalled behind thick, bulletproof plexiglass where it remains today, um, and this is how we see it today. The resulting visual, tactile, and experiential inaccessibility of the original may shed light on why casts are making a comeback. Once again, they are being called upon to serve as mediators, providing compelling evidence about the now lost viewing experience of the original or of Michelangelo's artistic intentions. For example, a Vatican cast was installed in the 2017 London exhibition of Michelangelo and Sebastiano, allowing for a kind of close study that is no longer possible with the original. And in the past few years, meticulously reproduced modern casts, and this is where I hope all of the lawyers and everyone else have some thoughts to share. Um, these modern casts made of bonded Carrara marble or bronze, making claims to authenticity because they are cast from molds taken directly from the original, have begun to appear in private collections, museums, and communities of faith worldwide. And here you can see the certificate of authenticity that comes with this uh, $330,000 statue. A Vatican-licensed entity named Arte Divine has as its stated mission the goal of placing at least 100 copies of the Pietà around the world to inspire spirituality and faith. And we can think what we want about that. Um, but what strikes me so much um, about these reproductions are the responses that they engender. Um, these casts, like icon to sacred archetype, invite intimacy, prolonged contemplation, and even touch, seeming to rekindle the viewer's sense of reverence and awe, whether what they seek are answers to questions of faith or nearness to the hand of the master. Thank you, Lisa. Final speaker is by Skype, and she is Mira T. Sundar Arajan. She is a law professor who specializes in copyright law, and she has directed the uh, LLM in intellectual property in the digital environment. So please welcome via Skype, Mira. Her talk today is called um, The Doctrine of Moral Rights, Obstacle or Conduit to Authenticity. Thank you. So I, I, I would, uh, first of all, just like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me to participate in this event and uh, for their uh, amazing ingenuity in making this work, uh, such a global panel in New York, London, Brussels, and uh, somehow we're all able to converse. So uh, thanks very much to them for, uh, for managing that. Uh, and also I, I would like to thank the two panelists who... Uh, uh, have given two such incredibly uh, stimulating, fascinating presentations uh, already on this panel. Uh, and I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see how some very similar language resurfaces as uh, I'm discussing some of the uh, legal approaches to these uh, very same, very real artistic and cultural issues. And so um, on the first slide there, uh, as, as was mentioned in the uh, kind introduction. I am a law professor and a consultant specializing in copyright, and I have a um, very strong interest in the moral rights of authors and artists. And one question that has preoccupied me increasingly over the years is uh, what is the relationship between artistic creative ideas of authenticity and legal ideas surrounding that very same notion? 
So the title of my uh, brief talk tonight is uh, going to be Moral Rights, Obstacle or Conduit to Authenticity. And to explore this question, I thought it would be useful to go back to fundamentals in a sense, if we could go to the next slide. And uh, just start right away by considering really, very, very briefly what we mean by a catalogue raisonné. So I borrowed uh, here from the New York Public Library uh, to come up with a relatively simple, straightforward definition. Uh, catalogue raisonné is a comprehensive, annotated listing of all the known works of an artist, either in a particular medium or all media. And uh, what I found interesting about this is the notion of authenticity not only applying to a single work, but of course to the entire corpus of works, the body of work as a whole of a given artist. Uh, all right, so, uh, so I had looked at this brief definition of the catalogue raisonné, and I wanted to go on to my slide number three and uh, consider as an interesting point of comparison the definition of uh, moral right, also known as uh, droit moral, since it is fundamentally a concept we English lawyers have borrowed from French law. And uh, it's a little bit more diffuse as a concept to define, as you can see from these examples here. So we talk about moral rights being about being properly named or credited when your work is used, the way your work is treated and shown. That's from Arts Law Australia. Uh, we have the idea of non-economic rights held by the authors or creators of the copyright work, which always stay with the author or creator, and that's the government of Queensland, also Australia. And then we have a U.S. Copyright Office definition in the context of a study that they've undertaken over the past couple of years. The term moral rights is taken from the French phrase droit moral and generally refers to certain non-economic rights that are considered personal to an author. So in my own definition, I've uh, synthesized a number of those terms to try to arrive at something a bit more descriptive. Um, I think we all agree that they are said to protect non-economic interests of those who create works. And the kinds of ideas that we see coming into play are non-economic, non-commercial, personal, uh, spiritual, occasionally cultural, or simply special interests, as they are variously called. The important thing being that they arise out of the very act of creation. And moral rights are part of the package of rights that are protected through copyright law. So they stand alongside economic rights as part of that fundamental group of rights that all author, authors and artists generally have. And to dis distill that notion down uh, into the actual rights that are recognized in law, typically there are two broad rights, one being the right of attribution, of direct relevance to the question of authenticity, and secondly, the right of integrity, which also has some relevance because it involves an element of protection for the reputation of the author or artist. And these rights generally are considered to be derived from an important international convention on copyright law, the Berne Convention, which dates from 1886 but has been updated several times and which the United States joined at the end of the 1980s. Uh, pretty much every jurisdiction in the world adheres to the Berne Convention. So this basic framework for moral rights in that sense is recognized universally in all of the world's legal systems at this point in time. Here in the United States, there's an interesting piece of legislation that many of you have probably heard of, uh, which implemented the Berne Convention, known as the Visual Artists' Rights Act of 1990. And this is the only, or I would say primary, federal legislation in the United States protecting the moral rights of artists. And it is actually an amendment to the Copyright Code, as I mentioned at the beginning, and simply entitled Rights of Certain Authors to, again, Attribution and Integrity. And uh, I've provided slides with uh, detailed text on them for those who might want to use them later on for their reference, but just focusing on the key words here, uh, what do we mean by attribution under the VARA? Well, it is the right to claim authorship of your work, to prevent the use of your name in relation to a work that you did not create, and interestingly, to remove your name if anything has been done to your work, causing prejudice to your honor or reputation as its creator. And if we go on now to slide number eight, uh, the integrity right, we can see that again, this idea of prejudice to honor or reputation is key because essentially this is what the act aims at. If any damage is undertaken, not only is it damage to the work, but it's damage that has had an impact on the reputation of the author. And this is specifically what is prohibited under the VARA in the United States, which closely follows the language of the Berne Convention. 
But an interesting second point here as well is that U.S. law prevents the destruction of what is called a work of recognized stature. And although the circumstances in which this provision can be applied are very specific, it's quite a fascinating thing that U.S. law is ahead of the rest of the world in this regard. It is one of only two jurisdictions that specifically prevent the destruction of a work of art as part of the moral rights granted to an artist. The other one being India, where the principle is recognized as part of case law. So if we can go on to slide number nine, um, I think the interesting question here is, does authenticity in the artistic or cultural sense equal attribution as we understand it within copyright law and within the doctrine of moral rights in particular? And in this regard, I wanted to talk about two examples. If we can go to slide number 10. Uh, first of all, the example of Rodin, which we've already heard uh, quite a bit about in a very fascinating context from Liz. And uh, secondly, I'll have one more very brief example and then draw some conclusions in the interest of keeping the presentation within time. And of course, uh, we'll welcome questions if you want to go into further depth on either example. So with uh, Rodin, again, we've had quite a bit of factual background from Liz, but I'd like to fill in some of the uh, blanks in terms of what actually happened with Rodin's legacy after the author's death. And I have borrowed uh, extensively from the information provided by the Musée Rodin in Paris, beginning here with slide number 11, where the specific issue of respecting Rodin's moral right is identified by the museum. And this goes back to uh, the circumstances that were alluded to previously by Liz, which is that uh, Rodin had actually donated all of his works to France, to the French state, along with the copyright associated with those works. And this was the basis on which the Musée Rodin was really founded. And in fact, there are two sites for the Musée Rodin in Paris for those who are interested, one being the main museum at the Hôtel Biron and the other one being in Meudon, which was again uh, discussed by Liz in some more detail. And what is very interesting here, if you go to the second paragraph that I've reproduced, is that the museum also acquired a specific obligation, which was to make known Rodin's work and ensure the moral right attaching to it is respected. So the museum is, in a sense, uh, entrusted with an obligation to act on behalf of the moral rights in Rodin's legacy of artistic creation. So if we go to slide number 12, um, the museum has actually published its understanding of what is meant by the moral rights in those works. Oh, sorry. So we need to be on slide number 12. Okay, so the, the uh, museum here has actually uh, gone to the French intellectual property code and explains effectively the nature and content of the moral rights protected in relation to Rodin in article 121.1 of the code. And the key here is the right to respect. So the code tells us that the artist enjoys the right to respect of his name, his quality, and his work. Moreover, that that right is perpetual, so it lasts forever, it's inalienable, it belongs only to the artist, and it's imprescriptible. It can never be assigned to anyone. And the form, spirit, integrity, and details of the work must be protected as part of the moral rights understood under French law. The museum then goes on to identify specifically the right to paternity, which we also call the right to attribution, based on which the museum says it contests the fraudulent attribution to Rodin of a work of which he is not the author, as well as the right to respect of his work. And the goal is to ensure that the artistic integrity and spirit of Rodin's work are respected. So a very interesting uh, interpretation, if you like, by the Musée Rodin of the legal framework surrounding Rodin's legacy. So if we go to slide 13, the museum then warns us to beware of confusing original editions in bronze with reproductions. And it explains exactly what is meant by the, the terminology. So original editions in bronze have to do, again, with going back to the, the legal language here, the code itself stipulates that editions of sculptures limited to 12 numbered casts, including artist copies, are considered to be original works of art. And the, sorry, any other reproductions will then be known as reproductions or aftercasts. So very clearly described by the museum, what in its view constitutes an original versus a reproduction aftercast of a bronze. And if we go then to slide number 14, 
that takes us to the actual policy on moral rights formulated by the Musée Rodin, where it tells us the Musée Rodin reports the presence of a growing number of bronze reproductions or aftercasts whose appearance fosters confusion with original casts, which have been authorized either by the artist or the Musée Rodin. When put up for sale, these reproductions are often accompanied by documents, notably certificates attesting to their alleged authenticity. Confusion thus created enables works to be ascribed a quality sought after by collectors, rareness. And then they conclude, since the original edition of bronze is frequently complete, any new edition of these sculptures and films can be reproduced, and casting them without that mark reproduction constitutes an infringement of Rodin's moral right. So some very clear uh, indications by the museum through its policy on moral rights of Rodin, what constitutes authenticity in relation to the sculptor's work. Very, very briefly, I just want to uh, offer one more example here uh, now of, a, of an artist who, in a sense, couldn't be more different from uh, Rodin, the Canadian Haida sculptor Bill Reed, who died in the late 1990s. And here in this photograph, I've reproduced one of his best-known works called Raven and the First Men, which actually depicts a creation myth of the Haida people that uh, Raven was walking along the beach and found a clamshell inside which was humanity. And uh, that's what's depicted in this uh, sculpture kept at the University of British Columbia Museum in Vancouver. So Bill Reed um, had a, an extraordinary impact on Canadian artistic life. In fact, he was said to have essentially single-handedly reinvigorated the tradition of Haida carving through his uh, work and indeed through his efforts at community building among uh, other artists that he uh, knew and encouraged to develop their own talents. When he died in uh, the late 1990s, uh, an article was published in Maclean's magazine, which is a sort of the Canadian equivalent of time, where um, some questions were raised about Bill Reed's methodology, particularly towards the end of his life when he had become physically less mobile due to disease and so on, and it was therefore less able to manipulate works of art on his own. And so here I offer two contrasting uh, comments. First from an artist, George Rommel, who worked with Bill uh, Reed, who said, Bill was great at using experts. He didn't hire you because of your chisel. He hired you for your soul, your whole energy. He expected us to dig him out of the fire. Some artists use clay, Bill used people. And in contrast to that, uh, Matthew Teitelbaum, the director of the Art Gallery of Ontario, who said, uh, this is a surprise to no one. And, and specifically what he was referring to, as, as I, I hope you've gathered at this point, uh, is that uh, obviously Bill Reed engaged a number of other artists to work with him on the creation of his works. And as I said, increasingly so towards the end of his uh, professional life. Uh, you, you could possibly compare that to a studio situation where uh, artists such as Michelangelo have worked in the past. And so to go back to the quote from Mr. Teitelbaum, he says this is a surprise to no one. In fact, the notion of the artist's workshop is a time-honored tradition. And I call this slide Moral Rights versus Moral Rights because, of course, now we're talking about at least two artists. In the quote there, George Rommel versus Bill Reed. Or is this a time-honored tradition that the law needs to understand and respect? So a very, uh, very thorny and difficult question. So if we can go ahead to slide number 17, um, if I can draw some, some interesting points out of these two cases and out of some comparisons now between the artistic and legal approaches to authenticity, I think we can clearly see that there are some problems with the copyright framework, with the copyright understanding of authenticity. There is a very clear and I would say rigid definition of who an author is within the tradition of copyright law. An author is an individual who has made the work with his or her own hands. Originality means that the author has created the work by himself or herself. So how do these concepts confront the reality of works, as in the case that we've been considering in this conference, cast from an artist's models during his or her lifetime or indeed posthumously? And one of the troubling conclusions that we have to draw, I think, is that art relies on law for the enforcement of its conventions. So 
this is an important question. And in the example that I gave with Bill Reed, I think what we're seeing is a real collision between artistic practice and a legal understanding of authorship, which has in its turn flowed back into society and influenced how we think, arguably, about authorship as well. So if we can go on to slide 18, what are some alternatives to this uh, rigid copyright framework? Well, I think moral rights overall could be helpful because as I hope the brief examples I gave you help illustrate, moral rights show some new that isn't present in the general framework of copyright law that is different from the economic rights aspects of copyright. Notably, there are some alternatives to authorship and originality. An important one of those is the idea of the intention of the artist. And in case precedents involving moral rights in different countries, including the one I've alluded to here, uh, a case involving film colorization of a film by the director John Huston, which was decided in France in 1991, this case essentially took the director's own statements about filming in black and white as evidence of how his work should be treated after his death. So the intention of the artist was determinative. And in that case, we had actual quotations, but it's also possible, possible to infer things about uh, the artist's intentions from various circumstances. And this is one way in which moral rights are very different from copyright law as a whole. Artistic intention, or the artistic conception involved may be given pride of place in contrast to the economic aspects of copyright where the expression of the work generally trumps the idea behind it. So if we can go on to slide number 19. The idea of the public interest is a very important one as well because typically in moral rights jurisprudence, we see an attempt at balance, in particular balancing the prerogatives of authorship with the public interest in cultural works. In the tradition of Anglo-American law, balancing has been the norm where copyright is concerned. But a very interesting development has been that even in jurisdictions with very strong moral rights protections like France, the concept of balance has become important. And again, I've provided a case reference for anyone who would like to look further into this uh, on their own. If we go to slide 20, we have an extremely interesting precedent in the United States recognizing the public interest in cultural heritage explicitly as part of moral rights legislation. Now, that's not in VARA, not in the federal legislation governing moral rights, but in state legislation that preceded VARA by a considerable time, in particular the California Art Preservation Act of 1979, which states blatantly, explicitly, the legislature finds and declares that there is a public interest in preserving the integrity of cultural and artistic creations. And I think this is a, a very powerful idea. We go to slide 21. We've explored some practical alternatives looking at the practice of the Musée Rodin. One solution that they have found to the problem of authenticity is to limit originality to a fixed number of copies. This maintains the quality of rareness, which the museum points out is associated with value. But I would like to point out as a critique of that as well, that rareness is a different thing from originality. And again, going back to artistic intention, we need to ask ourselves, is this what the artist would have wanted? And why is scarcity desirable? What are we trying to preserve through scarcity? Artistic reputation, cultural heritage, economic value, of course, or any particular one or all of these at the same time? They're potentially both complementary and conflicting objectives, clearly. And uh, finally, slide 22, I think the, the most important of the 22 slides that I've shown today, something very urgent that must be approached as an alternative where these problems are concerned is dialogue. In particular, dialogue between artists and lawyers. We don't talk to each other enough. And in particular, lawyers, I think, don't know enough about how artists think about these various concepts of authenticity, and as Liz's presentation so beautifully illustrated, how they work with them in the course of their practice, just a, an absolutely key issue. Artistic concepts need to shape the law, and legal concepts need to support the arts, in particular to avoid many of these detrimental effects, chilling effects, commercialization at the expense of creativity, the suppression of freedom of speech. And on the other hand, we want to protect ourselves from the deterioration or destruction of cultural heritage, the abuse of artists, of course, and the loss of artistic traditions. 
So I hope this has been a useful and a very brief look at um, authenticity from an artistic and a legal point of view. And uh, on the last slide, I've just put my, my contact information. We'll be delighted to answer any questions or uh, respond to anyone who has uh, further points to raise about anything that I've presented in these slides. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mira. I think some of the uh, issues she raised have been uh, um, things that we've been probably thinking about all through the conference this morning. So I think I'll just open that up to questions and comments. Uh, is there a microphone that can, yeah. Susan? It's coming. Uh, this is a question for Mira. Uh, how does the law define exactly who is or who is not an artist? I mean, is there a pre is there a pre existing definition on which the artist's rights um, regulations are based that that define who among the world's creative or creators of things are artists versus non artists who also make things? Absolutely not. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, this is one of the this is one of the problems with the legal regulation. Uh, there is no distinction from the copyright law or moral rights law point of view between uh, a, a person who creates something and an artist creator. So, if you like, no distinctions of quality are made. So, a person who makes an industrial drawing is considered to be legally equivalent to a Rodin who makes a great work of art. And that's an excellent question. The problem of lack of definition is something that permeates copyright law throughout the world and in the United States. You know, we don't know exactly what a work is. We don't know exactly what we mean when we talk about originality, artistic creativity. So this is why I tried to present my distillation of what I understand uh, about these concepts based on my experience. But that is about all the guidance we have. It's just our our experience. There's a real lack of clarity within the terminology that's used by lawyers. There's absolutely no doubt of that. I'm Jack Flam from the Daedalus Foundation. Um, I was at a conference last year where somebody brought up the issue that in the United States, moral rights die with the artist. Is that true? It is true. Most of the time, uh, there is a small sort of loophole where, uh, but I mean, it's, it's very complicated. It applies to a very narrow group of people whose work may not have been published by 1989, 1990. Um, but yes, otherwise it is generally true. And that's a major difference between the United States and other countries in the world. So if we go back for a moment to the Berne Convention, I mentioned that as the sort of source of moral rights at the international level. The Berne Convention basically says that all member countries need to protect the moral rights of the artist for a period after his or her death. They don't say what that period is, but some period. And so many commentators would argue that US law doesn't conform to its international obligations. And this is obviously one of the reasons why the US Copyright Office has finally opened a period of study into this area of law because you know, conformity with the conventions is one thing that needs to be studied. One of, one of the issues that I think people who are um, the heirs of an artist in this country, whether it's an estate or in our case a foundation, which has been given all of Robert Motherwell's copyrights, is how do you protect the moral right through copyright? And one thing obviously is to not grant permission for reproductions of works that are altered or severely cropped, et cetera. But something else that a, a lawyer friend mentioned to me as a possibility would be through trademark. And I, I don't remember the exact legal term. I think it's called the Lanham Act, which is um, an act that protects a kind of a brand or, or trademark. And therefore, if somebody altered the work, they would be damaging you in a way that you could respond through the Lennon Act. Could you say something about that, whether it's true or not, and how that would work? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just, a few words that you were saying at the beginning cut out. So if I'm getting off topic, please feel free to redirect me. But uh, the Lennon Act protects what they call the, um, 
authenticity of origin or the attribution of origin of a work. And the, the whole United States position on moral rights is, is frankly very strange because when the United States joined the Berne Convention, they enacted the VARA. The VARA is a highly restrictive piece of legislation. So let me start by saying that even though it does formulate the attribution of integrity rights, and you pointed out how one of the restrictions is the lack of duration uh, granted to those rights, but there are other issues as well in terms of, of applying those rights. So one of the arguments that was made by the United States at that point was that there were alternate mechanisms under US law to protect moral rights, therefore legislating them as part of copyright law in any extensive manner was not needed. And one of those mechanisms was actually the Lanham Act. So historically speaking, what you're describing is, is absolutely right. And there are some well-known cases, uh, for example, the, the case involving Monty Python. I could say, say more about that on another time if, if you uh, contact me. Um, you know, where reliance was made uh, on the Lanham Act to say that if a work is altered in some, in some way that, that essentially makes it misrepresent the creator, then it would fall afoul of the, the Lanham Act. The problem is that in 2005, there was a United States Supreme Court ruling in a case called uh, Daystar, where actually this very issue was considered, could, uh, a more, sorry, could the Lanham Act stand in for a moral right of attribution in a copyright case? And the United States Supreme Court was very, very critical of that issue. Actually, I would argue not as critical as they could have been, but commentators have taken that case and run with it. And the current understanding of the position is that you can no longer use the Lanham Act as a stand-in for protecting moral rights in relation to artistic works. So a kind of a termination of that old method of dealing with attribution and integrity has now been achieved. So the United States situation in relation to moral rights is quite tenuous because basically you've got VARA, you've got art preservation statutes at the state level to whatever extent they continue to be valid. You know, CAPA continues to have some validity because it goes beyond uh, VARA in some respects. It's faced constitutional challenge for that reason. Um, but, you know, this is, this is the basic situation where since 1989 we've actually seen a narrowing of the options available to protect the moral rights of artists. So, Hopefully, at some point, that will change. You know, I think that would be good for for creators in the United States, but it's not on the immediate horizon. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yes, it does. It. I just have one very brief follow up question. Then, why do you? What, how, how do lawyers outside the United States feel about why the United States historically has lagged behind in granting creators various kinds of rights? That is to say very late joiner of the Berne Convention, uh, moral rights die with the artist, etc. Is, is there a, a feeling of some national characteristic or something <laughs> that makes US law so uh, weak in protecting the rights of artists and creators? Well, I think this is, a, this is an absolutely profound question, uh, and I'll, I'll try to give you a brief response. Uh, first of all, the United States is not uh, alone in the world in having some reservations about moral rights. In fact, all of the other countries of common law heritage have a similar reluctance to uh, enact moral rights in their laws as well. And so I think there is a sort of culture of the common law that we have recognized historically where, you know, perhaps we tend to be a bit, uh, you know, practical and, and uh dare I say, even commercially minded when it comes to culture as opposed to our uh, civil law and, uh, and other, other uh, sister legal systems, um, you know, where there are a lot of difficulties with the application of moral rights, things like, you know, being able to offer evidence, you know, deciding whether there is a subjective or an objective wrong and does that distinction matter, you know, things that, that uh, English lawyers and those ultimately who have come afterwards, Canadian lawyers like myself, uh, American lawyers and so on have found difficult to grapple with. So we prefer to stay within the practical, more easily circumscribed realm of, uh, of economic rights. Um, having said that, I think the United States is also a special case because uh, historically you've had a constitutional background for the protection of copyright, which has really emphasized the public interest, which is a great thing. But then you get into the question of how do you interpret the public interest? And in the United States, the interpretation of the public interest has been to limit copyright, 
in other words, to limit the author's right, because an author creates, but then the work needs to be made available to the public for the benefit of education, the dissemination of culture, and so on. Except the trouble being that that's not actually how it works in practice. Copyright is usually acquired by the publisher, by a media conglomerate, and so on and so forth. And so it ends up being quite a powerful corporate right that's exercised by corporations, with, frankly, both the individual artist and often the public interest suffering in that process. Um, so I think there are structural factors involved. Um, but the United States is as proud or more proud of its culture than any other country in the world. So. I don't think that this is a, a divide that can't be bridged. It's just an, an evolution that has to take place in a natural way in this particular legal culture. Thank you. Um, sorry, this is another question for Mira. Um, I'm not sure if you heard this morning the paper on the Mayol estate, but it, it's interesting to make the comparison between the Mayol and the Rodin situations, because they're both doing posthumous casting, but obviously in different ways. Um, and perhaps one reason why they're different is that one is private and one is public or national. But at the end of the Mayol paper, we heard about what's going to happen now at the end of copyright. So is the case with Rodin that the copyright is owned by the state and therefore it's, it's, the Rodin is a different situation? What's the, why is the copyright so different in relation to Rodin and Mayol? Would, would you be able to elaborate when you when you ask why is the copyright so, so different? I, I, again, a couple of words cut out, so I Sorry. may have just missed your, your key point. Well, I Do also, you mind repeating? Yes, I may be misunderstanding. But um, it seems as if with the end of Mayol, the end of copyright with Mayol, anything can happen. But with Rodin, he's still protected by copyright. What, why? Well, actually, the, uh, that, that's, again, a really interesting question. So it's not that Rodin continues to be protected by copyright. He continues to be protected by moral rights, because under French law, the protection of moral rights lasts forever. So what's the, so dif what's the difference? There's actually no time limit on moral rights in legal terms. But what tends to happen as a practical matter is that as you become more and more removed from the artist, you get into the question of who is there to exercise the moral rights and who's going to have standing to do that. Now, that problem in Rodin's case has been circumvented by essentially assigning the estate to the Musée Rodin and thereby uh, the Musée itself acquiring the right to act on behalf of the office. So I think that is a peculiar situation that, in, in fact, it's... I wouldn't say it's unique in the world, but it's one of very, very few that I know of in the world where an institution is empowered specifically by the state to act on the basis of the moral rights of the author. So perhaps that's the, the difference between the two uh, very interesting cases. Hi, Daphne Barber, National Gallery of Art, uh, Washington. This is a question for both of you. Um, one regarding, in the context of the moral rights and Rodin and um, the ownership of, of his legacy, what do you do when a contemporary artist molds his posthumous bronze and who is involved in that discussion? And this is something that you thought of as you uh, conceived your project. Did you have to, or was it just a blessing from the museum director? What was involved in undertaking your project? This is actually an interesting issue because uh, I also did performances around, for example, the, um, the work of Alexander Calder, Tony Smith, and Richard Serra, um, and each case was different. Um, but those case, um, the way that it was dealt with actually depended somewhat on the internal politics of the museum. For example, um, the Rodin works in the collection had been donated to, by the Cantor Foundation. Um, they did not contact the Cantor Foundation, uh, but actually representatives from the foundation came to view the performance um, and uh, thankfully were actually excited about the activation of the work. Um, in the case of the Calder estate, uh, because I was drawing upon correspondence um, from the archives, we did need to get permission directly from the estate because there was an active estate. I think also perhaps in the situation with Rodin, because uh, the Musée Rodin is um, incorporated in France rather than in the United States, um, I think it was very different, but also there was a politic at LACMA, for example, that was uh, in the process of preparing a Calder exhibition and uh, desired to uh, tread very lightly in dealing with Calder's estate when asking for permissions around um, the pieces of correspondence we were using. So um, it, it, there isn't, um, 
It seems like the kind of thing you would imagine that there's a written protocol for or a standard, but it actually really varies, in my experience, from um, institution to institution in terms of who asks who and when or if ever. Um, but in this case, we did not um, contact the Musée Redon because there was not necessarily a legal obligation to do so. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make a couple of comments there from a legal point of view because uh, I think this is this is sort of one of the problems that I was trying to point out in my my uh, presentation that you know under the law we have fairly rigid ideas of what can and cannot be done and clearly the Musée Rodin has found itself in such a situation with uh, counterfeiting that it feels that it needs to take a very strong position in order to protect and preserve the cultural legacy involved. And I don't think there's anyone in this room that would disagree with that priority on the part of the Musée Rodin. But on the other hand, when Liz is talking about her work and explaining what it is that she's done, you know, for, for me as a person involved on the legal side, you know, to call that in any way a violation of the moral right just seems like an absurd proposition. And in fact, more than that, it's a dangerous one, I think, because what we saw in your incredible description of your process is not only that you were, quote unquote, doing something, making a treatment of Rodin's work, but you were in a sense relearning the process of creation whereby Rodin himself made the work. And I would call that a transmission of artistic knowledge from generation to generation, which we absolutely want to preserve. Because the preservation of culture is not just the preservation of objects, it's the preservation of knowledge, you know, which is at least as important as the preservation of objects. So again, this is why I think it's so important that the law needs to be informed by some kind of practical understanding of what's going on with creative practice. Otherwise, we get to a situation where we have rigid rules that just make no sense in terms of the objective that we both want to, to foster. You know, the purpose of the law is to preserve culture and to make culture dynamic, to allow culture to move forward, just as the purpose of the artist is. So how do we join uh, forces on that? And just one more really quick comment, because it's very important, uh, Liz, what you were saying about how it really depends on who you ask in a way, and on how those discussions go and what the chemistry is and so on. I mean, there is that uh, uh, incredible aspect of um, randomness about how a lot of these issues turn out in practice, because you've got the letter of the law, which in many cases looks very strict. And then it's a process of negotiation and having the luck to be able to carry things forward and so on. And again, for, for me as a person concerned about culture, I find that a little bit frightening, that something so important depends on the discretion of the particular person or entity confronted with the, the question. We need to have some kind of better tools available to talk about this and to deal with it appropriately under the law. Um, and final point, if I can just say very quickly, because again, Liz alluded to that and it's really important. Uh, you were talking about the jurisdictional issue. When you do something in the United States, do you necessarily need to seek the permission of an entity in France? And uh, the answer to that again is it depends. Nobody knows for sure. Uh, because there is international comedy, but at the same time, U.S. copyright law is what applies in the United States. So if someone were to be in a position where they did something with Rodin's work in the United States that the Musée Rodin was unhappy with in France, there's a very complex legal process involved in actually bringing that before a court. You know, you wouldn't even know where to go. Is France or the United States going to be the jurisdiction? Will the court apply U.S. or French law? You know, at one point in time, there was a clear answer to that question. Now there isn't. We've seen the U.S. courts applying Russian law in copyright cases in the United States. And what does all of that translate into? Time, money, and stress. <laughs> so it would be nice to have more clarity around these issues from a legal point of view. If I could also just bring it back I to... I just throw in one, one last term that I forgot to mention in relationship to the issues um, specifically pertaining to my work, but I actually think overall for the panel to consider, um, is the issue of fair use. And one of the things that we did discuss, because the molds were fragmentary, and that because I wasn't intending to make full-scale copies of the Rodin work, uh, but I think in some of the other instances we've looked at, uh, throughout the day when there are alterations to the cast, um, when does it become something that is not the original? Because in my case, we weren't um, attempting to create Rodin works in any way. Um, and so I think this also, when do you decide when it is the work of that artist or not is another issue that comes up. But I was thinking also of the court precedent and the examples of Richard Prince's work, for example, in appropriating the marble.
Yes, and if we could just bring it back to Lisa's, uh, the final image of the Vatican's uh, new production of authentic Michelangelo's. <laughs> what happens to the moral rights at that point? I have no idea. They're, they're copyrighted by the company that's producing the cast, and they're, they have a, an insignia from the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I, I don't know. Yeah, speak into the microphone. Oh, oh. I'm so, the answer was I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they bear a number of um, copyright marks from the producers uh, to the Vatican Observatory Foundation, but I really don't know. I mean, there are some copies that exist in bronze that were authorized by the Casa Bonarotti, which presumably there's somebody living who has some kind of right to exert. I really just, it, I have not gotten a handle on it. There's too many. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, thanks you to all three of you for a wonderful ending to the first day. <laughs> and we'd like to invite you to a cocktail and uh, then see you back here tomorrow morning. <laughs>